I think we all owe a debt of gratitude to the Claremont Institute, sharing their 40th anniversary since their birth in honor of Winston Churchill, the greatest statesman of the 20th century. who in those dark days of 1939 and 1940 stood alone against the forces of barbarism and saved Western civilization that we enjoy tonight. And in particular, uh, we're going to honor with the Leadership Award from Claremont Secretary of State Mike Pompeo. I cannot think of a more successful first year of a Secretary of State in the half century since uh, the advent of Henry Kissinger. And uh, I want to say just very briefly for two or three minutes something about uh, both Secretary Pompeo and Claremont. You know, in the, uh, the collapse of the Roman Empire in the fifth century AD, civilization that, that had created Hellenism, Western civilization, began to erode, and people fled to the mountaintops, they fled to the east at Byzantium, they fled to monasteries, and they tried to keep alive the vestiges of all that had been good, free markets, the individual liberties, constitutional government, Christianity. And I don't want to be too overdramatic tonight, but in some ways, something's happened to California. And traditionalism and conservatism has disappeared, and there's institutions like the Claremont Institute, and I hope my own home, the Hoover Institutions, that are oases, oases in these dark times, and they're trying to keep alive civilization until the Enlightenment returns to California, and it will. When I first I think when all of us first learned about Secretary Pompeo, I think I referred to him in print as somebody's life that had been surreal. He's a child of Southern California, a native of California, but what, when I began to learn him, I thought nobody can be first in his class at West Point, Harvard Law Review, com uh, Army veteran, start a business, and have down-to-earth Kansas values all in one, and yet he was. I think surreal is the proper adjective. He, the secretary came in in one of the most dangerous and troubling times in history. Any time a society, a nation, a country transitions from what has been appeasement or complacence into deterrence, what was abnormal has been considered normal for years, for eight years. And so the return of normality is caricatured as abnormality. And that's, that's the task to restore common sense and deterrence without causing a war. And it's very difficult to do in history and very few people can pull it off. I'd just like to conclude with three observations about the Secretary's tenure. The first is, I think all of us understood that these wonderful institutions that had won World War II and, and the aftermath of World War II had been formed to keep the peace for the last 75 years had to be changed, evolved, or recalibrated, and yet could not be destroyed. And so whether it was NATO or the UN or the World Bank or the International Monetary Fund, the Secretary is dedicated to preserving them, but updating them, as they had to be updated. There were other agreements, the Iran deal, the Paris Climate Accord, that should never have been signed, but everybody knew that, but very few people were willing to say it, and he did. The second thing that is very important is what keeps the peace, unfortunately, given the nature of man, is not eloquence or a diplomatic temperament, but ultimately it rests with deterrence, or what the great Roman statesman, or maybe not so great Roman statesman, Cornelius Sulla said, you have to be no better friend and no worse enemy. And I think what the Secretary has done in his first year is to apprise the world that we do not go abroad to slay dragons, but it's a very fine and noble thing to be a friend of the United States, and it's not so noble or not so fine to be an enemy. And that is going to bring peace, and I think we've seen it.
And then finally, what I think maybe his biggest contribution in this wonderful first year has been to translate the Trump philosophy into a systematic approach to diplomacy. And it's very difficult sometimes to do that. And what he's, I don't mean that as a character of the president, I've said every president is not, does not have a systematic plan and somebody has to implement it. And that person has to do it in such a way that reflects what the president wants. And in this case, make America great was Trump's vision of America and what the secretary was trying and is trying as successfully achieving is to tell all of us it's not fated that China will be the world's hegemon. It's not fated that we're in decline. Wake up, everybody. We have the greatest, we're the greatest producer of food. We're now the greatest producer of energy. Our universities are the top rated in the world. We have the most stable constitutional government. And And we have the most ingenious, autonomous, and individualistic population in the world. And if we have a problem, it's in our mind, not ourselves. And so this idea that America has seen its greatest years, or China is fated to take over the world hegemony in 30 years, has been demolished. And I think a lot of that change in attitude is due to Secretary Pompeo. And with that, I'd like to introduce tonight John Eastman to lead the invocation. John Eastman is a board member of the Claremont Institute. He's a founder, a founding director of the Claremont Center for Constitutional Jurisprudence. He's the Henry, Sal Henry Salvatore Professor of Law and Community Service at Chapman University Fowler School of Law. And I think we all know him as a st staunch defender in California of individual rights and liberty. John, thank you. Thank you, Victor. You know, every one of these dinners, we always get some new people who don't know the Claremont Institute. So give me just a brief moment to uh, tell you a little bit about us. The Claremont Institute's mission, of course, is to restore the principles of the American founding to their rightful and preeminent authority in our national life. But just what are those principles? Well, we've got a roadmap in the Declaration of Independence that all men, all human beings are created equal, that we are endowed by our creator, not from government, but certain inalienable rights, including the life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that the only legitimate purpose of government is to secure those rights, not to redistribute from one to another group, and that because we are all created equal, legitimate government must be grounded on the consent of the governed. And that's where we get constitutionalism from. Now, for our nation's founders, establishing a government based on such universal principles was an experiment never before tried in human history. They succeeded beyond measure. The question for us is, can we continue to succeed? George Washington, in his farewell address, gave us a little bit of a roadmap of all the dispositions and habits which lead to political prosperity, he wrote. Religion and morality are indispensable supports. In vain would that man claim the tribute of patriotism who stands, who should labor to subject these great pillars of human happiness, these firmest props of the duties of men and citizens. The mere politician, equally with the pious man, ought to respect and cherish them, he told us. And let us with caution indulge the supposition that morality can be maintained without religion. With that in mind, it should be our fervent prayer that we once again include religious principle in our national discourse and to recover the, rational, the national morality that Washington thought was an indispensable support for our political prosperity. So with that, please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, the God of nature and of our forebears, the author of the self-evident truths articulated in the Declaration of Independence, who endows each and every one of us with certain inalienable rights, watch over us and guide us in our efforts to recover the divine mission of this great nation. 
We ask that you continue to bestow on our honoree tonight, Secretary Mike Pompeo, the wisdom and courage to advance the cause of liberty in this land and to protect the immutable truths of our declaration through our foreign policy to every corner of the globe. We ask that you bless the food before us tonight and all of those who have had a hand in its preparation. And we ask your blessing on all the benefactors of the Claremont Institute, particularly those gathered with us here tonight. Ours is a noble mission, inspired by your divine truths and advanced by their generous support. We thank you and for the nation in which we are privileged to live. In your name we pray, amen. Please enjoy your dinner in about 40 minutes during your dessert course. Uh, Claremont Institute President Ryan Williams will resume the, tonight's program with an introduction of the Secretary following a short video. And uh, we'll see you again in 40 minutes. Thank you. I rejoice at the 40th anniversary of the Claremont Institute, despite the fact that it makes me feel really old. I rejoice at the success of my student from here at Hillsdale College, Ryan Williams. That too makes me feel really old. I think I know why it's been successful. Its final cause is the same as the final cause of the nation, written in the Declaration of Independence under the laws of nature and nature's God. The love of those laws is what's moved America and it's what moved everybody who's run the Claremont Institute. Brian Kennedy, Chris Flannery, the late Peter Schramm, the late Tom Silver. Those are among my lifelong friends. And they came together and formed their friendship around the right kind of love. And ultimately, they're going to save the country. Congratulations. If I may, let me express my appreciation for Claremont in a personal story. Uh, when I entered college, I was a kind of a leftist kid. But by the time I finished graduate school, uh, I was a conservative. How did this happen? It was because, on the one hand, uh, I had an indelible love of country and also a growing admiration for the genius, brilliance, and beauty beauty of the founding and its principles and the, the very super high prestige universities with which I was affiliated presented a solid ideological wall. At that time, I thought they were nascent insane asylums and of course they have more than fulfilled their promise. I, I did not have the benefit of any kind of congenial atmosphere in which to work. As the conservative ecosystem matured, uh, eventually, um, Bob Bartley and Claudia Rosette took me into the Wall Street Journal, Bruce Chapman took me into Hudson Institute, and Larry Arn took me into Claremont. And I cannot tell you the delight that I had when I discovered Claremont's uh, devotion to the founders, the framers, Lincoln and, and Churchill. It was as if I had come home, I had rediscovered my, my anchor. Uh, such a an important task uh, fulfilled by so few institutions and by Claremont so well. There should be 10 Claremonts, or take your pick, possibly Claremont should be 10 times its size. Hello to all my friends at the Claremont Institute, especially Ryan Williams, Victor Davis Hanson, and my old teacher, Charles Kessler. I'm sorry I can't join in person, but I want to pass along my congratulations to you as you celebrate Claremont's 40th anniversary. I also want to congratulate my friend, Mike Pompeo, a worthy recipient of your Statesmanship Award. Mike calls to mind something Frederick Douglass once said about Abraham Lincoln. A patriot himself, his faith was strong and unwavering in the patriotism of his countrymen. There's no shortage of politicians who claim to love America 
in the abstract. But how many of them love the real America, a real land with real citizens striving every day to live up to its ideals? In other words, how many love America as a nation? Secretary Pompeo does, and so does Claremont. I learned this as a Publius Fellow more than 20 years ago. It's still true today. As friends and students of Claremont, we know that our founding principles, simple patriotism, and fellow citizens still have an exalted role to play in our politics. Claremont is almost unique as an institution because it promotes this healthy Americanism. We'll need it urgently in the years ahead to defend America in the realm of ideas. So congratulations again to Claremont on its 40th anniversary. Celebrate tonight, but don't take anything for granted because America needs Claremont for the next 40 years as well. Hi, everybody. Uh, this is Bill Bennett. Sorry I cannot be with you tonight. Uh, Elaine and I have tried and tried. We just can't do it. Happy 40th anniversary to Claremont. My goodness, 40 years. You are almost at maturity now. To me, 40 sounds like a bit of nostalgia. Wish I were back there. But it's a great evening, and boy, do you have a wonderful, wonderful speaker. A worthy man, uh, a man of incandescent intelligence, commitment, and conviction to this country. Uh, he's a man whom nothing can daunt and nothing can bribe, in the words of learned hand. Uh, I also admire uh, Mike uh, for uh, his character of his soul, his being. The Greeks have a phrase known by a lot of people in that audience, megalopsukia, greatness of soul. Uh, so you have a man of great soul with you. Forty years, my goodness, the Claremont Institute has therefore served two generations of Americans and the country is so much better off for that. Now, the problem with being 40 is middle age begins to creep up on you and you get creaky and weary. I see no sign of that in the middle-aged Claremont Institute, which is as full of intelligence and vinegar, both are important, as it ever has been. Four times a year, the mail brings me something that causes me a mixture of exhilaration and dread. It's the Claremont Review of Books. The dread is that on top of all the other reading I've got to do, I have to read the Claremont Re Review of Books all the way through, starting with Charles Kessler's notes through the back of the book and the cultural matter. It's exhilarating because every word requires reading because every word is excellent. Robert Frost great American poet once said, I do not want to live in a homogenized society. I want the cream to rise. The cream has risen in the Claremont Institute, and may your rise continue. Thank you to all who are supporting the Institute. Good evening. I'm Ed Meese, and I've been a longtime admirer of the Claremont Institute. It's a pleasure for me to join all of you in celebrating this 40th anniversary of the Claremont Institute and acknowledging all of the great things they have done for our country and particularly for the young people and those who are working in higher education. The Claremont Institute has been responsible for teaching and research and the promulgation of information about the founding principles upon which our country has been built. And those ideas uh, those principles, those basic free precepts which form the foundation of our governmental and social structure have been an important part of the progress that we've made over more than two centuries. So Claremont Institute and all of you who support it, thank you and best wishes for continued success in the years ahead. Hey everybody, Speaker Paul Ryan here. You know, I am honored to recognize the Claremont Institute on 40 years of celebrating and advancing America's founding principles. What a legacy of accomplishment. I began learning from Claremont Institute scholars and reading their papers back when I was a young staffer on Capitol Hill, working for people like Sam Brownback, Jack Kemp, and Bill Bennett. They all held Claremont in such high regard, and I quickly came to understand why. The Institute and its scholars are rooted in a belief in limited government and in the need for modern-day statesmen who can live up, or at least 
try to live up to the example set by our founding fathers. The Claremont Institute's work, it helped shape my views as a conservative, and it continues to play a prominent role in the public policy debates of our day. It forcefully and effectively advocates for first principles. And the Institute's work has influenced generations of conservative thinkers, activists, and office holders. Claremont is important not just for its past, but for its future. Whether through its writings, its teaching programs, or its litigating, the Institute's work is needed now more than ever before. It is a steadying force that provides moorings for the conservative movement, and I am grateful to celebrate their important work with you tonight. I also want to extend my heartfelt congratulations to the recipient of this year's Statesmanship Award, my good friend and our Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo. You know, when I received this award in 2011, I was just a regular guy in the House of Representatives who few, other than apparently the scholars at the Claremont Institute, had ever heard of. I was busy giving speeches on the virtues of Winston Churchill and writing wonky white papers on fixing our entitlement programs, which of course were only of interest to like 10 people, nine of whom happened to work at the Claremont Institute. I was grateful for the recognition very early on in my political career, but it's nice to now see that nearly a decade later, the Claremont Institute has really upped its game and is giving this prestigious award to someone who is known across the globe and who is doing an amazing job to preserve our nation's safety, security, and interests around the world. There is no better statesman today than Mike Pompeo. He represents our founding principles every single day, and he continues to do our country proud. So thank you, Mike Pompeo, and thank you to the Claremont Institute for all that you do to advance the principles that our nation and its leaders hold dear. Well, uh, once again, welcome everyone. My, my name is Ryan Williams. I'm president of the Claremont Institute. It's, uh, it's, it's great to be back in Beverly Hills, isn't it? Um, we often rotate this dinner between Orange County and, and here at uh, the Beverly Wilshire, and it's, it's always a really great party here at the Beverly Wilshire. Uh, a lot of you were... Um, enjoying your drinks and, and food so you didn't quite hear, but Larry Arn in that first video lamented that 40 years at Claremont uh, made him feel old. Uh, Larry, of course, was one of the men who helped found the Claremont Institute. Uh, so allow me just a, a little riff on a, a bit of Americana history. Uh, I'd like to riff on the 69-year-old Ronald Reagan's quip about the 56-year-old Walter Mondale in the 1984 presidential debates. So I make a commitment to you here now. I will not, from this podium tonight, exploit for my own purposes the youth and experience of my predecessors. <laughs> well, I mean, 40 years, um, that kind of tenure really piles up many, many debts of gratitude. And that's especially true when you're in the nonprofit business like we are. Uh, we have the great privilege and honor to rely on the support of all of you for what we do and for advance, advancing our mission on behalf of this great country that we all love. Uh, I'm eternally grateful for that, and I like to remind everyone that you know, we sell a few magazines, but 98% of what we do is dependent on supporters like you, so thank you very much. So I'd, I'd like now to honor and recognize some of the Claremont supporters uh, major supporters without whom nights like this and our work would be impossible. So I would just ask you to hold your applause till the end. Uh, we have a, a, a bounty of riches here. So first I'd like to thank members of Claremont's Board of Directors that are here this evening, including Roy Crummer, John Eastman, James Higgins, Brian Kennedy, Charles Kessler, and Larry Matson, and also I should say our, our chairman, Tom Klingenstein, who many of you know from, from remarks at these annual dinners and, and elsewhere. Uh, couldn't make it, had to cancel at the last minute. He sends his warm, warm regards and thanks. Um, I'd like to thank also our 2019 host committee co-chairs, 
uh, Yuri Vanatek and his wife, and Mike Malone and Cynthia Malone. So thank you very much. And I'd also like to um, you to join me in thanking really all of our host committee members. They've been uh, recognized in your program, and they, they were on a couple of easels around, around the joint. There are so many of them that to list them all, the, the Secretary's security detail would pull me off the stage. It would take too long. Uh, but, but thank you all, really, from the bottom of my heart and on behalf of this organization. Uh, please join me in thanking all of our supporters. <clears throat> Uh, we're also joined by some distinguished California public servants, uh, including Ambassador Stephen Rhodes, uh, former ambassador to the Republic of Zimbabwe, uh, the Honorable Mike Antonovich, former Los Angeles County Board of Supervisors, um, <laughs> Commissioner <clears throat> Greg Kowajian, uh, Los Angeles County Civil Service Commission, uh, Anna Moradian, Senior Deputy Sur Supervisor Catherine Barger, uh, Supervisor Barger couldn't be here, so she, uh, we wanted to honor uh, her representative. And you heard the table over there of fans of Supervisor Barger. Uh, Mario Guerra, former mayor of Downey. Richard Sun, former mayor of San Marino. Janet Wynn, former California state senator. And last but not least, uh, the 30 Claremont Institute fellows who are in attendance. Please join me in thanking all of them. So with so many new friends here tonight, I, I just wanted to take a few minutes to talk about our work. Uh, John Eastman mentioned the principles behind our work. Uh, uh, I'm the president of the place, so I can get to the practical part of our work. Uh, for everyone new to Claremont, uh, if you're encouraged or, or um, you're intrigued by what you hear here tonight, uh, please follow up with us if you'd like to get more involved. My door is always open. Uh, please reach out to Claremont or Claremont staff, and we'd be happy to talk more. Uh, there are many effective and excellent policy think tanks in Washington, in New York, here in California, and around the country. And while we often write about policy at the Claremont Institute, we've always been in the ideas game more than anything else. Our strategy has always been to shape the debate about ideas and principles that is, we think, upstream from the policy debates as important as those debates are. And so we educate, we write, and we litigate. Uh, that's my back of the napkin summary. Uh, we educate in our many fellowship programs, uh, supplying leaders in media policy, the law, academia, and politics with the education in Americanism that they should have gotten at their institutions, uh, fancy and otherwise, that they never did. We, we write in our flagship publication, the Claremont Review of Books, edited by my colleague Charles Kessler, uh, and in our newer online publications like The American Mind. Our goal with our writing really is to place ourselves at the center of the national debate about the future of Americanism and America, uh, with one foot always firmly planted in the principles of the founding, but uh, cognizant of the, the struggles ahead that require an adaptation of those principles and not their mere recitation. And then we litigated our Center for Constitutional Jurisprudence, led by John Eastman, who you saw at the beginning of the evening. This is where we really apply, thank you. This is one of our most uh, applied areas of work where we, we apply first principles to the pressing constitutional issues of the day in our nation's courts. Uh, and finally, I, I should mention, we do have one more area, a very important area of applied principles. Uh, we now have over 700, well, we will after these, the summer's fellowships, 700 members of our fellowship alumni community. They're our mission on the march, so to speak. Uh, many, of us are, many of them are here with us tonight, which I mentioned, so I just ask you to please stand if you're a Claremont alum, and thank you. They are all out there uh, defending truth, justice, and the American way. If you'll permit me one comic book reference. Um, they even include a few, a few members of uh, Secretary Pompeo's staff and uh, over 20 other fellows working in the Trump administration. And I wanted to talk... No, oh, thank you. Now, just a few words about a new campaign we've launched. Um, we're getting a little more political in, in uh, recent months. 
Um, it, it, the, really, the, um, reflecting the urgency we feel uh, of the times ahead of us. And the theme of that campaign is captured in the title of the essay I wrote about it, launching it really a, lot, a couple weeks ago, Defend America, Defeat Multiculturalism. Now, as I wrote, we're of course not against at all, we're not fighting against a multicultural America. Uh, the welcome and assimilation of, of new citizens from the far reaches of the globe has always been a great American strength. What we're against is the ideology of official multiculturalism, which wants to use identity politics to divide and conquer Americans and political correctness to shut us up when we complain about it. Uh, we had a little run-in with Google about this uh, recently. <laughs> I wrote in the Wall Street Journal a few days ago, I'm sure many of you saw it, uh, Google determined that our mere raising of this question had made us a race-based publication, and they forbade us from advertising this dinner because of it. Uh, initially, we were told there was no appeal. We, my lovely colleague Laurel spent two hours in, in tech support purgatory uh, with Google. <clears throat> And we were told, now you just have to remove the offending material. That's the only way to continue advertising. So naturally, we, we decided to raise holy hell about it publicly. Uh, we've got a large network, and it turns out we're pretty good at raising hell. Uh, so I got a call from Google's DC office, and they said, sorry, the whole thing was a mistake. You can now advertise again. Uh, and I, I don't want to take sole credit for that. I've, I, of course, have a wonderful team who, who helped us navigate that week of PR uh, and communications and elsewhere. But I, we were happy for the correction and the vindication. Uh, but I, I, I really do wonder how many thousands of organizations without our megaphone never get past the unappealable tech support stage. So we have to be very vigilant, I think, and I, from uh, what I hear from the audience, you, you're all in full agreement with me. We have to be very vigilant about our aspiring tech overlords increasing activity in this realm of freedom of thought. Uh, you, you help us fight these battles and, and for that we are very grateful. Um, and before I, I, now I'm finally going to introduce uh, our honoree tonight, but I did just want to say uh, these dinners are wonderful affairs. They would never happen uh, smoothly or elegantly at all, but for the, the staff of the Claremont Institute and the hotel staff. So please join me in thanking everyone who helped. Thank So now I have the distinct pleasure of introducing our honoree. Mike Pompeo is a perfect example of that very American and small r Republican phenomenon, the citizen statesman. You have his impressive biography in front of you, of course, in the program, but let me give it some due embellishment. And I, uh, I can't really improve on Victor Davis Hanson's historical perspective, uh, but, uh, but I will try. Uh, as Victor mentioned, uh, Mr. Pompeo is a son of California, grew up just down the road in Orange. He was first in his class at West Point, uh, served as an Army captain before receiving a law degree from Harvard. And before going into politics, uh, he founded Thayer Aerospace in Wichita, Kansas, with three West Point alums who were friends and partners. And then he would serve as, as president of Century International. Uh, I like to say he was a constitutional populist long before it was cool. Uh, he was elected to the House in the 2010 wave, Tea Party wave for the 4th District in Kansas. He would serve four terms representing Kansas, and he served on the Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence and the Committee on Energy and Commerce, as well as numerous important subcommittees. In November 2016, President-elect Donald Trump nominated Mr. Pompeo to serve as director of the Central Intelligence Agency, where he worked diligently to guard America from her enemies and advance the administration's national security agenda. And then finally, in March of 2018, President Trump nominated Mr. Pompeo to serve as Secretary of State. Secretary Pompeo was sworn in by another former recipient of the Claremont Institute Statesmanship Award, Justice Samuel Alito. Uh, 
uh, he sent his regrets as well. Uh, would have loved to attend, but you know, the, the ethics people in the federal courts, they're really sticklers. They don't let you come to fancy dinners that much. Uh, Secretary Pompeo's tenure as Secretary of State has been exemplary. We were all reminded of that, I think, while following the news over the last week. It's so refreshing to watch a Secretary of State manfully assert and defend the interest of America in the face of Iranian belligerence and Chinese deceit, and to do it with the calm reason and steady hand of a man well acquainted with the dangers of actual war. For Secretary Pompeo, like President Trump, red lines mean something. <laughs> uh, the theme of our award tonight, the demands of statesmanship, they encompass things big and small, the management of teams towards common ends with a sense of common purpose, and the adjustment to changing circumstances while always relentlessly, as Churchill would have said, doing good and avoiding harm for the country. Secretary Pompeo and his team stand as sentinels for America's interests abroad and the safety of her citizens here at home. I'm sure I can speak for all of us in this room here tonight when I say we all sleep much more soundly in the knowledge that the Secretary and others like him are manning the battlements of Western civilization. And so it is now my great honor to welcome to the stage as the 2019 recipient of the Claremont Institute Statesmanship Award, the United States Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo. Thank you. Thank you all. You know, people talk about my job being nerve-wracking. There is nothing as nerve-wracking as that much applause before you speak. Uh, I, you should know, Ryan, thank you for the kind introduction, too. Uh, I, was on, I was on this trip, and I heard about this little dust-up about the advertisement for this dinner, and it said they wouldn't let it post because of the offensive material. And I'm like, is that me? <laughs> Uh, but I also know, boy, with, with no advertisement in this crowd, I don't, I, you'd have needed a much bigger room. So uh, uh, it, it, it is wonderful. It is great to be uh, with a group of people that care about America so deeply. Thank you for having me here tonight. I want to, I want to thank the Claremont Institute as well. Uh, as you said, I just got back on a, a trip where I'd gone to Finland to talk about America's interest in the Arctic uh, I made a little detour to Iraq uh, and, uh, and then uh, back to London. Uh, makes Southern California weather feel pretty good. Uh, you should also know, I was, uh, you talked about this is, this is home. I grew up at basically Harbor and McFadden. My father still lives in that house. I was there today. Uh, the, uh, it, was, it was really something. He, he's lived in that house since, since 1961. And today they had the whole little street uh, blocked off with California Highway Patrol and the security team, and the neighbors are all coming out like, I know that kid. <laughs> <You know? laughs> uh, uh, you know, the, 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 Bible, the, the Bible describes John the Baptist as the voice of one uh, crying in the wilderness, and I, I sometimes think about the Claremont Institute that way. Uh, you know, I, I call Kansas home. It's where I uh, spent uh, the bulk of my adult life outside of the military, but um, I'd spent my childhood here, of course, when uh, Ronald Reagan was the governor. And I have to tell you, California's changed a little bit since I left. <laughs> so I, I may have to come back and help you all get it right. Uh, uh, it, it, it's so important that you all know, all, all the people who make uh, Claremont Tick, Ryan and the team, and all of those of you who contribute, 
uh, your, your work goes way past California. As, as Ryan said, uh, there's been a, a, a lot written in the Claremont Review of Books uh, that clarify the aims and undertakings of what we're trying to do in this administration and the hundreds of fellows that you've educated over the years who are defending the first principles on the front lines. In fact, Ryan mentioned I have a senior advisor, Mary Kissel, and a speech writer who's sitting over here to my left. The two of them wrote this tonight, so if you don't like it, it is on you. <laughs> It also will explain my Leo Strauss quotes, Leo Strauss quotes, so uh, you're the only ones that might laugh at that joke, so thank you. <laughs> Look, all kidding aside, your, your work to preserve the ideals of the American founding is absolutely what America needs. There is literally, as I travel the world, there is nothing more distinctive about the United States uh, than our politic, politics, and wonderfully so. We are the truly greatest experiment in human freedom that the world has ever seen, and I, as America's senior diplomat, benefit from that every day. Yeah. I, I want to do a little, bit of a, a little bit of a history, because the foreign policy of the early republic reflected the attitude of a free nation, which has thrown off an imperial power, which, frankly, I just left. Uh, <laughs> And I, look, I think there's three words that characterize that. They, they would be realism, restraint, and respect. And I'll, I'll talk about each of them for just, just a moment. First, uh, first, realism. The founders were keen students of human nature and history. They saw that conflict is the normative experience for nations. Hamilton put this in Federalist 34. He said, quote, to judge from the history of mankind, we shall be compelled to conclude that the fire and destructive passions of war reign in the human breast with much more powerful sway than the mild and beneficial sentiments of peace, end of quote. I'll simplify. The founders knew peace wasn't the norm. And in response to this reality, the founders knew the first duty of the federal government was to provide for the safety of its citizens. Madison said, quote, security is an avowed and essential object of the American Union. We all know that. How about restraint? The founders thought to protect our interests, but avoid adventurism. The Barbary War, fought so soon after independence, was an effort of last resort to protect our vital commercial interests. The Monroe Doctrine, relevant even today, was a message of deterrence, not a license to grab land. Peace and friendship, said Jefferson, with all mankind is our wisest policy, and, and I wish we may be permitted to pursue it, but the temper and folly of our enemies may not leave this in our choice. And finally, respect. The founders recently cast off the tyranny of an empire. They were not eager to subjugate others. In 1821, John Quincy Adams wrote that America goes not abroad in search of monsters to destroy, but indeed quite the opposite. She is the well-wisher to the freedom and independence of all. And as the first nation of its kind, the world would see America as a model for self-government and liberty. And a special bond would link America to any nation that loved those things. Let's contrast the founders' ideas to the foreign policy of the late 20th century and early 21st century. American leaders had drifted from realism. At the dawn of the post-Cold War era, hopes were high that enfolding the likes of China and Russia into a so-called rules-based international order would hasten their domestic evolution towards democracy. We hope this order, comprised of institutions and agreed upon by codes of conduct, would temper their actions towards neighbors and to our country. But we can see now, 30 years on, after the end of the Cold War, that the Putin regime slays dissidents in cold blood and invades its neighbors, that the Chinese Communist Party has detained more than one million Chinese Muslims in labor camps, and it uses coercion and corruption as its primary tools of statecraft. And as I'll talk about here in just a little bit, both countries have foreign policies intent on eroding American power. We can't blame our leaders for their optimism, but we can blame them for having misjudged those regimes. America, too, had become unrestrained, untethered from common sense. The institutions, the institutions we built to defend the free world against the Soviet menace had drifted from their original mission set. Uh, indeed, some of them had become directly antagonistic to our interests while we kept silent. We bought into trade agreements that helped hollow out our own middle class. 
We sacrificed American competitiveness for accolades from the UN and climate activists, and we engaged in conflicts without a clear sense of mission. No more. And to round out this trio, we had lost And to, and to round out this trio, we had lost sight of respect, not for other nations, but for our own people and for our ideals. We cozied up to Cuba. We struck a terrible agreement with the Islamic Republic of Iran that put the regime's campaigns of terrorism and proxy wars on steroids. And, and, many, and many of our leaders were more eager to delight the Davos crowd than champion the principles that have made us the greatest nation that civilization has ever known. <laughs> by the way, by, by the way, the Claremont Institute sadly knows. I could also name a certain tech company that we spoke about earlier that's forgotten our first principles too. <laughs> I am, uh, I'm very confident. I'm very confident the founders would have been perplexed by those moves. We had too much confidence in the international system and not enough confidence in our own nation. And we had too little courage to confront regimes squarely opposed to our interests and to our values. But I bring you good news. <laughs> One man said enough. And in 2016, you all sent him to the White House. <laughs> President Trump's prescription for foreign policy was very simple, right? America first. Now, that's been mocked a bit. The media has spun this phrase as a dog whistle for racists and xenophobes. Uh, but you know, I've spent a fair amount of time with President Trump, in fact, virtually every single day these past two years. <laughs> yeah, sometimes so good, sometimes. More challenging for all of us, yes. But here's what this really means. It means that, like millions and millions of Americans, President Trump loves this country and wants to see it do well in the world. Not at the expense of others, but to the benefit of our people, and by extension, the nations that share our values and our strategic goals. It's really that simple. If there is a natural law of foreign policy, this is it. And while he wishes every country enjoyed the freedoms we enjoy here, he has no aspiration to use force to spread the American model. You can see it in the administration's record of its using force. I can prove it to you. And so, and so importantly, he believes America is exceptional, a place and history apart from normal human experience, the ones that our founders spoke about. President Trump believes it is right, no, indeed more than right, for America to unashamedly advance policy that serves our interests and reflects American ideals. Certainly, certainly, our course of action in this administration reflects a gut level, a gut level for love of country. But taking the pursuit of America's interests up a notch is not just honorable, it's urgent in this new era of, era of great power competition. On, on China? The President has taken action to stop China from stealing our stuff. No longer will American companies be forced to hand over their technological crown jewels as the price of doing business in China. When a, when a deal doesn't work for the United States, no deal shall be done. We've bolstered our military presence in the South China Sea. And we've put nations on notice around the world that the sale of key infrastructure and technology companies to China threatens their national security. And we've strengthened the group, uh, the entity that screens Chinese and other foreign investments here in the United States. We're also fighting the battle to make sure that the Chinese Communist Party cannot burrow into the data of billions of internet users through companies like Huawei and ZTE. The internet of tomorrow, the internet of tomorrow must the Internet of Tomorrow must have buried within it Western values and must not belong to China.
this has been a real pivot to Asia. <laughs> so look, how, how else are we putting America first? As, as I, I gave a speech in Brussels, I didn't get any of this applause. <laughs> um, <laughs> I talked, I, I spoke that day in Brussels about international agreements and institution in which the United States enters. And I said that to, for us to continue to participate, it must be with our consent, it has to serve our interests and ideals. It seemed pretty straightforward. Uh, look, consider our stated intent to withdraw from the Intermediate Range Nuclear Force Treaty with Russia. The, I, don't watch much TV, but I've seen the media mandarins swear up and down that America was putting the world closer to nuclear war. But as the 28 NATO al allies unanimously concurred, Russia's in violation of the treaty, putting Vladimir Putin closer to an asymmetric advantage of his nuclear forces. Why would one party honor a deal when the other wouldn't? It made no sense. <clears throat> we, uh, we, we chose to abrogate the treaty, but not abrogate defending uh, the American people. I, uh, I, I'll put it another way. Our decision on missiles wasn't rocket science. <laughs> yeah, that was one of your own wrote that one. Uh, look, we're also working to ensure that the future of international agreements unambiguously advances American interest. Uh, you know, past efforts uh, agreements that we'd entered with North Korea only produced more North Korean nukes and American diplomatic failure. Uh, our diplomacy with the DPRK is laser focused on making sure that we never again have to reopen the North Korean nuclear file. I, uh, I, I just this past trip to Hanoi spent, and came across a major threshold. I'd spent more time with Chairman Kim than even Dennis Rodman. But I, 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 want, I want you all to know, this is, this is, this is serious business. We, we, we want to make sure that Americans are safe, and we are determined to get our policy with North Korea and to get our allies, Japan and South Korea, and to convince the Russians and, and the Chinese that this is in the world's best interest, and our diplomatic efforts to get the entire world to engage, to see the risk for what it is, and to help us get North Korea to a brighter future is something that uh, our administration is profoundly proud of. And finally, putting America first means proudly associating with nations that share our principles and are willing to defend them. It's true. Uh, we had some earlier comments from Washington's farewell address. He warned against permanent alliances. But that same speech praised connections with nations based on policy, humanity, and interest. We've reaffirmed America's historic alliance with the only free nation in the Middle East, Israel. We are, we are banding together with like-minded nations like Australia, India, Japan, and South Korea to make sure that each Indo-Pacific nation can protect its sovereignty from coercion. It's part of a greater commitment to a free and open order. You, you all know this. The distinctive mark of Western civilization is the belief in the inherent worth of human beings with the attendant respect for God-authored rights and liberties. Indeed, the Declaration says that all men are created equal, and we ought to help nations protect these first things and human rights as well. This, this new pride in taking America's interests seriously is not just an American phenomenon. Countries all over the world are rediscovering their national identities, and we're supporting them. We're asking them to do what's best for their people as well. The wave of electoral surprises has swept from Britain to the United States, and all the way to Brazil. You, you've all heard the famous line, what's good for General Motors is good for the United States. Uh, I actually think the last administration would have said, what's good for the world is good for the United States. <laughs> Our focus is that what's good for the United States, a foreign policy animated by love of our unique way of life, is good for the world. And as I, 
As I wrap out, I, I want to I talk about why that is. First, countries who share our same principles find new avenues for collaboration with us. I, I mentioned before, I, I returned from an Arctic Council ministerial, uh, a bunch of foreign ministers from eight countries who, whose nations touch the Arctics. I made it clear that America is now sharpening its focus in an area of increasing strategic importance. We want to cooperate with like-minded democracies who share our vision of the Arctic and guard against those who don't, nations like China and Russia. My task as America's most senior diplomat of building alliances is hard work, but they're essential for securing the rights the founders sought to protect. Second, love of one's country forces leaders to better honor the will of their own people. President Trump does that every day. <laughs> Hamilton had it right. Hamilton had the right idea. He said, under every form of government, rules are only trustees for the happiness and interests of their nation. If democratic leaders are not responsive to the jolts of patriotism which are sweeping the world, they won't be leaders for long. Those who understand the nations are the best vehicle for securing the rights of their citizens will have a much longer shelf life. Yeah, <laughs> third. The third reason why is that I've always been a big believer in competition. I didn't like it when I ran a small business. I wanted my own little monopoly. Uh, but the truth of the matter is we all know that America can compete and win against our adversaries on, ec on security and any economic issue. But even more importantly, competition forces the best ideas to rise. And among political ideas, there is none better than the American idea. I have, I have the enormous privilege to serve as America's most senior diplomat. And what I want the world to see, the unsurpassed attractiveness of the American experience is something I market every day. I want other nations to take this same path. Our first president desired the same thing. He used words like this. He said, quote, the applause, the affection, and the adoption of every nation, which is yet a stranger to it. Look, what I've just outlined here is a foreign policy that returns America to old truths. We talk about this inside the State Department all the time. Let's speak about real facts and real truth. It's something I know that this institute, the Claremont Institute, has a deep appreciation for. President Trump has helped put the world back on track to a nation-first trajectory. And I'm confident that this reawakening will last well beyond this, his presidency. As just one example you should see, look how both parties now are on guard against the threat that China presents to America. Maybe except Joe Biden. <laughs> God love him. <laughs> Winston Churchill, a name very near to this, dear to this organization, said, America is like a giant boiler. Light a fire under it, and there's no limit to the amount of heat it can generate. <laughs> a fire was truly lit back in 2016. Bathed in this light, we've embarked on a foreign policy that takes seriously the founders' ideas of individual liberty and constitutional government. And because of it, American exceptionalism and the American founding will remain alive and well in the 21st century. Thank you, God bless you, and may God bless these United States of America. I think you'll agree that there's many reasons to thank President Trump over the last two and a half years, but none more than giving us this kind, firm, and wonderful man as our Secretary of State. Thank you for coming tonight, and with the conclusion of the Secretary's speech, 
The program ends, but you're welcome to stay and enjoy each other's company. Thank you.